Shalom Aleichem, folks. Let this mind be in you, Chapter 2, The Influence of Homer. I don't recall whether or not my public high school in California offered any historical courses in cultures other than Spanish or American history. At the college level, however, depending on the institution, there are typically several cultural history courses primarily offered as electives. Grecian or Greek history is one of them. Before we continue, let's go to Yah in prayer. Heavenly Father God, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we thank you and we praise you, Father, for the blessing of this new morning. We thank you uh, for restoring to us the breath of life. We thank you for this opportunity to share together a portion of your word, and we pray that you would allow your Ruach HaKodesh to govern, guide, and direct all that we do and say in this teaching. Uh, Father, we pray that you would uh, humble us and allow us to uh, have open hearts and open minds that we might receive all that you have in store for us. And we give you all praise, honor, and glory in Yeshua's name. Amen. Good morning. Thank you uh, for being back here with us. Brad begins chapter 2 with a brief statement followed by a couple of questions, important questions. In like manner, I've already made my brief statement prior to our prayer. So here are my two questions. By show of hands, how many of you have ever heard of Homer? Secondly, of those who have heard of him, what do you know or remember about him? Not to worry, though. Our text will give us the basics here in a moment. The brief statement, opening chapter 2, is this. And I'll probably leave my readers on a bit more than usual because there's a lot of reading to do this morning. This opening statement, the New Testament makes several references to Grecians and to what had become commonly known as Hellenism or Hellenistic. From the death of Alexander the Great in 323 BC to the death of Cleopatra VII in 30 BC. The two questions following that opening statement are, what is Hellenism and what influence did Hellenism have on the culture of Yeshua's time. You may recall from our chapter 1 teaching that Brad transitioned by informing us that Hellenistic culture was dominating the uttermost parts of the earth. At the time, the Brit Kalasha or the New Testament was penned. This chapter gives us some details. Now, as I mentioned before, I may have my readers on um, extensively because there's so much for us to read in this particular video. And I have to admit that it was quite the challenge to pare this down to the highlights that I wanted to offer because the whole idea is to not read the whole book to you. <laughs> that would defeat the purpose of doing teachings on highlights. And... The other part of the idea is to encourage each of you to go out and purchase your own copy. And, uh, of course, we'll talk about that again later at the end. But I want to do something a little different with this video. Just thought of it uh, this morning. How about I offer a copy, a free copy, of this text, of this book, Let This Mind be in you to whoever 
the first person is that writes a comment and let me flip back here to the final page of the script the first person who mentions something that I'm going to talk about at the end of the script at the end of the teaching and you can tell me what comes next after you hear me read this this would be a good point to pause our highlights on chapter 2 as difficult as it is for me to apply the what go ahead and respond with whatever the what is with a hashtag or however you want to put it end of chapter to offer and whoever does that will respond and make arrangements with that individual to get them their free copy of this book so now if I can remember where I was at we'll get back to it but the challenge was there's so much uh, highlighting that I did in the second chapter that picking and choosing the most appropriate to stick in here and have it flow uh, so that you would still be encouraged to go ahead and uh, read this for yourself but at the same time not lose the flavor of what this chapter is about the influence of Homer so let's move forward Brad writes that the term Hellenistic was coined in the 19th century. It was used to designate the period of Greek and Near Eastern history from the death of Alexander the Great in 323 BC, which was part of our reading, or before the Common Era, to the death of Cleopatra VII, who was the last Macedonian ruler of Egypt in 30 BC. In academia, we learn about something referred to as an age, an era, or a period. All three are a different way of saying basically the same thing. A way of referencing a block of time and whatever is most closely associated with that block of time. You may have heard of the Iron Age or Golden Era of Hollywood. The Hellenistic period is similar to those times that are thought to have changed the way we live, although most remain in some small degree or another. Hellenism is still with us. Think of it as a chronic condition, if you will. And I picked that wording on purpose. Many, if not all, are familiar with the concept or the idea of a chronic condition. People have chronic heart conditions. There are many people like myself who have uh, chronic arthritic conditions. People have any number of other chronic diseases or ailments or issues in their life. There are literally hundreds of these various designations, none of which have a, well, typically most don't have a positive connotation. More often than not, we wish, we hope, we pray that we could be rid of those chronic conditions. That's what I do with regard to Hellenism because I have developed a really good understanding of how it has impacted the entire world in terms of its relation to being able to understand the word that we were given as our instruction book for our life from our Creator, Yah. And in order to best understand this, we need to be able to understand it from its original language, the language with which it was written in the culture, in the culture where it was written. 
in order for us to understand it the best that we possibly can. So, as I mentioned, not only are there um, hundreds or thousands of these uh, various designations with, refer with regard to chronic conditions, there are also hundreds of these various designations of an age, an era, or a period. In our text, Brad continues, <coughs> excuse me, the early Hellenistic period saw the emergence of a new form of relationship, compounded from Macedonian and Near Eastern traditions, which became the dominant political, religious, and social structure in the Eastern Mediterranean after Alexander's death. What I want you to catch here is the idea that politics, secular religion, and I say secular because as I've mentioned on numerous occasions, there's only one true religion and it has nothing to do with all of these various man-made religions. So I refer to them as secular religion. If you want to know what the one true religion is, turn to the book of Yaakov or the book of James chapter 1 and that final verse, verse 27, and that will let you know which religion is ordained by our Creator, ordained by the all-knowing And trust me, it has nothing to do with anything that anybody gets involved with on the weekend, we'll say. Whether it's the day that we were told to set apart, the seventh day, or it's the beginning of the next week, the first day, some worship day. The idea that politics, secular religion, and social functions are all governed by relationship. Now, the idea that they're governed by relationship is not the issue. The issue is the foundation that those relationships are built upon. And they're not built upon the ideas or the thoughts or what we've been given from our Creator, Hashem, but on the ideas, the thoughts, the foundation of man, which has veered away from the ways of our Creator. This next part is fascinating, and I'm curious to know how many of you knew this. The Helen of Hellenism comes from the writings of a blind poet by the name of Homer. Most Greek scholars are not convinced that this man actually lived, but for someone who may not have existed, he was certainly very influential in the shaping of Greek art, science, philosophy, religion, and social justice. Literally every aspect of Greek life and thought was fashioned through or based on Homer. Brad continues, his alleged writings were called the Iliad and the Odyssey. Have you heard of those? <coughs> Excuse me. These were epics set in the 12th century BC about a war between Greece and the city of Troy. As with most things, Hellenism was a gradual shift in thought, resulting in an entirely different way of living. Remember what we spoke of earlier. 
in terms of the transition from chapter 1 to chapter 2, when we spoke of the uttermost parts of the earth, the influence of Hellenism, <coughs> excuse me, his, uh, so when we talk about the war between Greece and the city of Troy, it's where the Trojans come from. Not a book on Greek history, but we need to understand the background from which Greek thinking comes. Let's see. As a matter of fact, the Greek stories of the first century AD had the Hebrew conquest of Canaan or Canaan already morphing into the story of the Iliad. The story of Canaan or Canaan, you know where that comes from. And the wanderings in the wilderness transferred to the Odyssey. You also know where that comes from. Excuse me. Something that I've said on a number of occasions, and I've actually continued to study uh, in depth, is the fact that Hasatan, the adversary, the fallen one, he was in existence way back when. We hear about him and his influence in the creation account, in the beginning, near the beginning, I should say. And we have to understand that if we accept the fact, which I do because it's in his word, that Hashem knew the end from the beginning, it's not unreasonable to believe that the adversary caught wind of various things that would come along. And what he has a tendency to do is to take large portions of Hashem's word in his way and alter it ever so slightly in order that it might have a completely different impact and a completely different meaning than what it was originally designed for. I spoke a little while back about the one true religion. How many religions are there? A whole lot more than just one. How many denominations are there within each religion? Now, the adversary is real good at helping people come up with excuses for things. And with regard to religion, well, you know, we have different languages, we have different cultures, blah, blah, blah. There's only one God, one true and living God. And he ordained one true religion. All that other stuff doesn't matter. He created us. He created all that you see. You mean to tell me that he was not capable of helping each culture, each various language, understand specifically his one true religion? Yes, he was, because it has nothing to do with what we typically define religion as. Does it matter which language you speak or which culture you're from to understand that you are to look after the widows? Take care of the homeless or the fatherless? 
I meant the orphans or the fatherless? Does it matter which language you speak or which culture you're from to understand the idea of remaining unstained or unspotted from the world? No, it doesn't. Any excuse that people come up with to steer away from the ways of Hashem, they're easily torn down because they're superficial. And they have nothing to do with reality. I have this saying that I, I tend to use. People will always be able to come up with an excuse for not doing something that they really don't want to do in the first place. Or they'll come up with an excuse for doing something that they already want to do anyway. That's the influence of the adversary. And I'm not going to get too deep in the weeds on all of that. That's for another time. Let's get back to this script. I've done an extraordinary amount of study and research on what comes next. So when I came across this, I got the distinct impression that Hashem led me to this in order to confirm the validity of my study or my research. Let's go to it and see what it says. Most of the anti-biblical or pagan cultures we are familiar with, Greek, Babylonian, Persian, etc., have a woman or goddess type mother that represents that culture. That's interesting that this would come up in this video at this particular time of the year. I didn't design it. But anyways, Isis, Astarte, Ishtar, and Gaia are some examples. The background of Hellenism is from Egypt no less. Greek intellectuals of the historical period claim that Greeks owed a great deal to the older civilization of Egypt. Greek mythology, the stories that Greeks told among themselves about their deepest origins and their relations to the gods, was infused with stories and motifs of Near Eastern origin. Now, that last part that I read, that wasn't just one long flowing. There is a little highlight here, a little portion there, and a little portion there. And, you know, there was other stuff in between, but I wanted to try and have it flow so you can get an idea of what that whole area was about. <clears throat> Excuse me. Brad continues on with exploring this area and takes his readers deeper and deeper into an understanding of these origins and connections. It's difficult for me to forge ahead, but for time's sake, I must. As we move forward, please pay close attention here. I believe this is the last part of our reading. The term Hellenism conveys the idea that a mixed cosmopolitan form of social and cultural life combining Hellen Hellenic, i.e. Greek, traditions with indigenous traditions emerged in the eastern Mediterranean region during the aftermath of Alexander's conquest. These represented a mixture of Hebrew ethnicity and Greek worldviews. He put this in to provide for us the background for the term Grecian or Hellenist, which was applied to many Jews of Yeshua's time. 
we go back again to that uttermost parts of the earth. They, the Grecian or Hellenists, represented a mixture of Hebrew ethnicity with Greek worldviews or Greek thinking. So, identical to what you see today, how you have English-speaking folks that don't necessarily have a quote-unquote Western way of looking at things. The bottom line is, is there's a whole mismatch, I can't think of the term that's used, but this big stew of the way people think about all kinds of things. And I think they even have a term for it called free thinking. <laughs> Whatever that is. I know what it is, but being facetious. Hashem is not about chaos. He's not about disorganization. Everything that he has done, everything that he continues to do, has a specific purpose in mind. There's a reason for it. The way he set up the foundations of this earth on which we live, winter, spring, summer, fall, Midnight, three, six, nine, noon, three, six, nine, midnight, so forth and so on. First day, second day, third day, through the seventh. First day, second day, third day, through the seventh. Everything is organized. There's a reason for everything. And his ways... And his instructions, his guidance, his teaching, his laws for us, all follow that same path. So this whole concept of free thinking is, is another tool of the adversary to drive you away from having the mind of Yeshua. This would be a good point to pause our highlights on chapter 2. As difficult as it is for me to apply the parking brake, I'll do it anyway. So give yourself a break for breakfast, lunch, supper, or snack, depending on your personal viewing routine. And we'll pick up from this point in our second part of Chapter 2. So obviously I'll be releasing this when the second part is released. It'll be released together. Again, for those of you who would like to go ahead and get a copy of Let This Mind Be In You, in order to read it in its entirety, with the exception of the person who's going to get a free copy, <laughs> or have it with you as we go through the highlights, go to Brad and Carol's site at www.wildbranch.org. That's www.wildbranch.org. Dot org. Shalom and be blessed this day.